This is the second lecture in the series in the basic coaching course conducted by the National Football League. And our concern in this lecture is to look at the acquisition of skill and how football coaches can help young players to acquire skill. We can perhaps do it best of all by asking ourselves a series of questions. And our first question should be, what are coaches trying to achieve? If we look at this chart or diagram, we can see in it the basic requirements for a person who is to become a skilled performer. In the centre we have the skilled movements of a highly skilled performer. And then we have a number of the characteristics which mark the highly skilled performer. Firstly, he will be physiologically economic, that is, he's going to use less energy in what he does on the football field. He will have good technique, his movements will be smooth, and he'll be able to do them without a great deal of effort. These two tie very closely together. He'll be adaptable, that is, the highly skilled footballer has the ability to take his skill and put it into all sorts of situations, and is able to cope with wind, with weather, with wet weather, and is able to do his skills in every circumstance. The highly skilled performer has all the time in the world to perform his skills. We often hear it said of certain players that they appear to be casual in their approach. They appear to have all the time in the world to perform their skills. And this is the mark of the highly skilled performer, that he does, in fact, have all the time in the world. The highly skilled performer is less subject to distraction. He's able to carry out his skills regardless of the noise of a crowd, regardless of other players perhaps trying to put him off what he is doing. And finally, the highly skilled performer has less fluctuations in his skills. He's consistent. He kicks the ball regularly the distance he can kick it. He's able to mark the ball consistently. Seldom does he have these fluctuations that quite often occur with players who are less skilled. And so as coaches, one of our aims is to develop these characteristics, the skilled movements of a highly skilled performer. And so perhaps what we should look at next is to ask ourselves the question, what must be, be considered if we want players to be highly skilled, if we want them to acquire skill? And there are three basic areas we have to consider if we want players to become highly skilled. The first is we have to consider the level of the learner. Because obviously what we're going to do with a young player will differ when we are working with an adult. We have to consider the demands of the skill. Certain football skills are far more demanding than some of the other skills. And we have to take that into account when we prepare and work with our players in an effort for them to acquire skill. And last, we must consider the learning situation. And it must be the job of the coach to set up the ideal coaching or learning situation to enable young players to acquire skill. Let's firstly consider this area. We must look, as I mentioned, at the level of the learner. And you could ask yourself the question, why should we consider the level of the learner? Well, obviously, we come to the question of readiness. How ready are young players to acquire skill? And what we have to take into account are a series of factors indicated in this diagram. First, we must consider the physiological factors involved. Are the players ready to learn the skills in terms of their growth and motor development? How easily, for example, can they become fatigued? Young players are fatigued very quickly if they're working on some of the skills in our game for any length of time. And the coach must consider this when he prepares his coaching program and when he carries out certain activities at a coaching session. The mental factors are very important. We have to consider the intelligence of the group we're working with. Are the young people able to cope 
with the concepts and ideas we're trying to get over to them when we teach them the skills of the game. We must consider the concentration level of the group we're working with. Young children have a very limited concentration level and it would be quite ridiculous for us to expect them to work for long periods of time on the skills of the game and still retain their concentration in what they're doing. So this has to be considered when we consider the level of the learner. And finally, we must take into account certain psychological factors. Where is the interest and motivation of the group we're working with? Are they ready for what we're trying to get them to do in the practice? Are they able to cope with the work we're trying to get them to do? Are they interested in it? Will they be motivated to work hard at it? Because if they're not interested and motivated, we know certainly that they will not respond in the way we might want them to respond. We need to consider, of course, the phases through which players develop. We do know that there are certain learning phases and young people pass through these phases when they're acquiring skill. The first phase is commonly called the early or the cognitive phase. And this is the phase when the young players are really sorting out the skill, are trying to get a clear concept or pattern of the skill. They spend quite some time at this phase, sorting it out and working out just what they're trying to do. And it's very important at this stage that the coach give them a very clear picture of just exactly what he wants them to do in the skills he's working on. Many of the young people in this phase use skills I've already acquired and which are related to the new skill they're learning. And it's up to the coach to try and point out the clear picture of where their previously acquired skills fit in with the new skills they're attempting to acquire at that level. The young person then moves to what we call the intermediate or associative phase. This is the phase when the person has got the basic idea of the skill and is now trying to iron out some of the errors, some of the faults, and consolidate the good patterns of the skill. So he's getting rid of the false movements. He's getting rid of the unnecessary energy that he might expend in using muscles that are not required to do a certain skill. It's the associative or intermediate phase. Depending on how demanding the skill is, the person may stay at this stage for quite some time. And then finally, the young person moves from the, the intermediate phase to what we call the final or automatic phase. And this is the stage when the young person has acquired the skill. The skill has become automatic. He no longer has to think about what he's doing. He's able to do it without, or without actually thinking about the details of what's involved. Now, some of these things are indicated in these diagrams. You'll notice that it concerns a discus throw, this particular diagram, but the things that we can point out, which indicate the phases through which the young person might be working, are these. You'll notice, first of all, that there is a difference in the lines indicated on the diagram. The complete line is what we would call his performance, week by week. Whereas the dotted line indicates the learning that has taken place in that skill over a period of time. Now you'll notice that in the early stages, this particular discus thrower had quite considerable fluctuations in his performance. And this is typical of what goes on when a person is first acquiring a skill. His performance fluctuates as he tries to get a clear concept of what he's doing. And then, as he becomes more proficient at the skill and passes into the intermediate and ultimately into the final stage, so we find less fluctuations in his performance. But right through the period, we see this improvement as the person acquires or learns the skill. Now if we look at our next diagram, we'll see 
in this diagram that as people acquire skill, so certain things occur with their performance. You'll notice that in all of the three lines which indicate the javelin thrower's performances, that you do get considerable fluctuation and you also get an area where very little improvement is made. In this centre line, for example, you can see that the performer for quite some time during these two years made very little improvement in the skill. This is very typical of what happens in the intermediate phase where the person may stay and make very little improvement in the skill as he tries to sort out the errors that occur in his performance. And so it's important that the coach bear with the player, be tolerant and be willing to go along quietly with the player while he is acquiring that skill until he reaches a stage where the skill becomes automatic and we then begin again to see improvement in his performance. So what we're concerned about is asking ourselves this question. How can we as coaches help the young person to better acquire the skills of the game? And in our next diagram, we see what is a very basic pattern for the teaching of a skill. Let me explain this diagram to you. When a person attempts a skill, he first of all takes in a certain amount of information from what's around him. He then processes this information in his central nervous system, the CNS, in the brain, and as a result of that, he makes a decision to carry out a certain action, which we say is his output. And that's what a person does when he performs a skill. Takes in information, processes in some way or other that information, and then performs the skill. Now, of course, before he can do that, the performer must have a very clear plan or picture of the skill he's about to perform. It's impossible for him to do a skill unless he has, in some way or other, some concept, some plan of what's involved in the skill. And that's the job, of course, of the coach or the teacher, to help the learner acquire, first of all, a very clear plan or picture of the skill. Once a person has acquired this plan or picture, he then attempts the skill. And then it's the function of the coach or the teacher to help the person perfect that skill. And so he does it by giving back to the performer some feedback, or what we commonly call knowledge of results, to enable the performer to be able to change his action, to perhaps improve the information that he takes in, to perhaps improve the decisions that he makes about what happens with certain parts of his body when he's performing the skill. And ultimately, to make sure that his output is what we are trying to achieve, that is, the skilled movement. So the job of the coach is to help the person acquire a good plan, and then having acquired that plan and tried the skill, to help him modify, change, perfect the skill, to get the skill to a stage where it really can be referred to as a skilled movement. And so we must ask ourselves the question, what are the factors which do affect skill acquisition? What does the coach need to take into account when he's working with a group and attempting to help that group acquire skill? Our next slide indicates that we must take into account the value of trial and error in what we do. Some people say the best way to teach people skill is to simply give them the equipment and let them go away and try the activity. And that sooner or later, they will acquire the skill that you're trying to get them to acquire. But this chart indicates that that perhaps is not the best way to go about it. This was a little study conducted in the area of archery. And they had two groups working. 
one group who were given no tuition whatsoever. That is, they learnt the skills of archery by trial and error. They were simply given the equipment, some safety measures, and then allowed to go away and practice for a period of 18 sessions, as indicated by our bottom axis. Another group, who started at approximately the same level, were given constant tuition by a coach or by a teacher. And you'll notice what happened over the 18 practice sessions. That over that period, the tuition group, the people given instruction, improved considerably in their ability to do the archery skills. Whereas the non-tuition group, after making some improvement, then got to a stage where they made very little improvement at all. This is what we call the plateau effect. They made very little progress. And so that immediately says to us that perhaps trial and error isn't in fact the best way to go about acquiring skill. So we can ask ourselves the question, where then does trial and error come into the learning situation? And I think this diagram probably indicates to us the place of trial and error in learning. That in the early stages of learning, formal instruction of some description is very important and trial and error plays a very, a very minor role. But as the person works with the skill and begins to make some improvement, so trial and error becomes a bigger part of the learning procedure. And it's at this time that trial and error takes over more from the formal, formal learning process. And the teacher or the coach may leave the group far more to their own devices to practice the skills and work on the skills once they have at least established some improvement in the skill. So formal instruction is quite important at the beginning of the learning procedure and then trial and error begins to play a more important part. So how does, in fact, the coach help young people acquire skills? He obviously must communicate with the group. And this is one area where certain coaches have problems. They have difficulty in making it clearly understood to the group just what they want the group to do. And it is important that the coach make perfectly clear to his group just what he wants them to do. He must make it perfectly clear that they understand just what he wants them to do. This means that he will point out the key features, the key points about the skill, and tell them precisely how he wants them to go about practicing those key features. You might ask yourself the question, well, just how detailed does this description have to be in the early stages? How much does a coach have to tell the players about the skill they're trying to acquire? For example, if we're working on the drop kick, just how much detail does the coach have to go into about the various aspects of the drop kick that are needed for the learner? Well, we've found that over a period of years, if the coach goes into too much detail about the skill, then there will be problems. The young people become confused because they're trying to remember too many things at once. And the essential thing in the early stages of people attempting to acquire a very difficult skill like the drop kick in football is that they must just be given a general pattern or what we sometimes call a gross framework of the skill. And then the person must be allowed to go away and practice using that gross framework or basic pattern until they get the feeling of the movement. And then the coach can go back to the group again and say, okay, now we have the basic feeling, the basic pattern. Now is the time when we can start to look at the details of the skill. Now your problem is, young man, that you are not dropping the ball correctly. Or perhaps you're not kicking with the instep. You're using your toe too much in the kick. But these details can be given to the young players once they have acquired a general feeling of the movement. 
And so in the initial stages, the coach must stress the key features of the skill and then let the group at least acquire this feeling before he starts to go into the detail. Let me hasten to add, however, that it's very, very important that when the coach is working with the group, he makes it clearly understood to the group just what they have to do for the skill. Now, how do we do this? Well, there are lots of ways. A teacher or a coach can use verbal communication. That is, he can simply describe in words how they should do the skill. But of course, the younger the group, the harder it is for them to translate the verbal information that the coach gives them into the actual action of kicking the ball. So it's probably better in the initial stages for the coach to use demonstration. And so he says to the group, now you watch while we demonstrate the skill to you. He points out the key features. He perhaps verbally communicates certain basic information about the skill. And then he lets the group practice that skill. The other very important thing for the coach to remember at this stage is that any errors that may become evident as the young player tries to perform the skill must be quickly eradicated, quickly eliminated. It's no good leaving errors. If the lad has a basic problem in that he's not bringing his leg through straight when he kicks the ball, or perhaps he's dropping the ball incorrectly, or using the incorrect part of the foot to kick the ball, then the coach must very quickly move in and eliminate that error. Because if those errors become consolidated, and the young person passes through that early phase and into the associate phase and finally gets to the stage where the skill is automatic and he still has that basic flaw or error in his technique, then that becomes a very difficult thing to eliminate once it has become automatic. So it's essential that in the early stages the coach attempt to eliminate any of the large important errors which might occur in that skill. We then come, if you like, from there to the actual practice, organisation and situation. We assume now that the coach has been able, by demonstration, by communicating with the group, by pointing out the key features, he's been able to get the young players to at least a try or attempt the skill. We then say, well, how does he go about using his practice time effectively to enable the young people to get adequate practice to acquire the skills and to perfect the skills. You know, there is the old adage, practice makes perfect. But that adage is actually incorrect. Because if practice is not done in the correct manner, then skill will not be acquired. And it's essential for the coach to emphasise that practice must be used effectively. And of course it's the coach's responsibility to set up effective practice situations. Now you immediately ask yourself the question, how long should practice sessions be? Well that's a very difficult question to ask and to answer if you don't take into account the level of the group with which you're working. If the group, for example, is a very young group, you may find that your practice sessions will need to be very short. If it's an adult group, of course your practice sessions can be longer because they can concentrate for longer periods of time, they're less likely to become fatigued. However, you must also take into account what you're doing in your practice sessions. It's no good working on one particular skill for a long period of time with young people who are reasonable beginners, if you like, in the game. Because they will find that their motivation decreases, the fatigue sets in, and then they're not really acquiring the skill you're trying to get them to acquire. And so we talk about the way in which you distribute your practice. And if you want to spend a certain amount of time, let's say it's 30 minutes, on a skill such as kicking, perhaps it's better to break that 30 minutes into ten, three 10-minute sessions and intersperse those three 10-minute sessions 
with perhaps some other skill or some other activity. You'll then retain their motivation, they're less likely to become fatigued, and you'll also retain their concentration in the skill of kicking. It is important that you distribute your practice wisely so that you retain motivation as the group are working on their skills. It's also very important that you use your time effectively. There is the danger, of course, that you can waste time in practice and planning is necessary to make sure that practice time is used effectively. It's also important that you make good use of your facilities and your equipment. And if you have plenty of footballs, then use them and don't have many footballs sitting on the side not being used effectively during a practice session. If you can work on a system where two players have a ball between them and they work on the kicking skill, that's much better than having five or six or ten players working with the one football and therefore getting less opportunities to practice that basic skill. So it's important that the coach effectively use his practice sessions. It's also very important if you remember our diagram on the basic pattern for learning skills and teaching skills, that the coach or teacher provide adequate feedback or knowledge of results. This can be done in all sorts of ways. In football coaching, we make far too little use of things like targets. We make too little use of lines on the oval. We make too little use of skill tests that have been devised. And if you look in the coaching manual, you'll find the Davy skill test, which is an excellent test which can be used as a means of enabling young players to know just how their skills in football are going. Finally, I'd like to mention a word or two about motivation, because it's very difficult to get value with a group unless you motivate that group. And our chart indicates a number of the factors which can be taken into account in motivating young players. We need, for example, to keep a very, very close watch that those players are getting a reasonable balance of success in what they're doing, because we know that if players are continually failing, then they lose their motivation. We need to use competition wisely. It can be a very motivating thing in football practice, but if it's not used wisely, it can also be demotivating. So we must use competition wisely. We must provide our players, as I mentioned a moment ago, with knowledge of results and feedback if we are going to expect them to improve and to be motivated. We must set for them realistic goals so that we don't expect them to achieve what is beyond their capabilities. We must try in our practice sessions to keep plenty of novelty and variety in what we do because again we know that if we keep doing the same activities over and over again that the motivation of the group will diminish. So if we can put some novelty and variety in what we do at practice then we know that this will keep motivation reasonably high. And we must be careful that we never present a situation, particularly with young players, where they are put into tense, anxious situations which they cannot cope with and which they will shy away from. Again, we can lose motivation. In this series of cartoons, we can see the importance of success with a young player. The young girl playing golf, you'll notice in our first slide, misses the hole and hates golf. In her second slide, she again misses the hole and hates golf. The third slide, the same again. And you'll notice the proprietor of the golf course does something about it. He enlarges the hole so that he assumes, assumes that she will then get success and become another satisfied customer. And success is very important if we hope to retain motivation among young people when we're working with them in a skilled situation. The slide here indicates the importance of knowledge of results and also of a realistic goal. It was a little study done on circuit training with a group of students in Melbourne. And the two groups, group one and group two, made considerable improvement over an eight or six week period because they were given constant knowledge of their results 
and a realistic goal to work for. The difference between Group 2 and Group 1 was merely the fact that Group 2 were given a more realistic goal than Group 1. But you see what happened with Group 3. A number of them made very little improvement and in fact some deteriorated in their performance because they were given no knowledge of their results. The person didn't tell them whether they were improving in their circuit training and they were given no goal at which to aim. So motivation is an important thing and we must remember these uh, important factors which will affect the motivation of the group. We must remember that it's essential that a coach provides his group with constant knowledge of, his, of their results if he's going to expect them to improve on the skills they're working on. One final comment about progression. It's very important that the coach devise skill practices which enable people to move from the very basic skills to the stage where they can ultimately apply those skills in the game situation. And so the first step is to make sure that the young people have the basic technique of the skill involved. The second stage is to take those skills and show the various variations that are possible with the skills. The third stage, to take those skills and put them into game-like situations, functional situations so that the players know when those skills are applied in the game. And finally, the last two phases are when those skills are taken and put with opposition and put under pressure, which really takes the person from the skill, the very basic skill, to the ultimate game situation. The job of a coach is to make sure that he has enabled his group to acquire the basic skills of the game. And I remember a quote which I think clearly indicates the importance of the teaching of skills among young people. And the words of the quote are these, clearly the greatest need in any ball game is the perfection of ball play. A billiards player does not train by walking around a table, nor will a footballer better his football skills by just running around the field. Complete exercise for the body can be provided entirely by skill activities in football.